good evening everyone welcome to jnanavarthini with the ever evolving technologies in today's interconnected and technology dependent world it is essential for organizations to stay ahead of the curve by proactively implementing compliance measures today we are going to listen to mr shashank dara who is going to speak about adopting a risk based approach to vulnerability management uh, mr shashank is a cyber security technologist inventor with the five us patents prolific security researcher and award winning product security champion he is co-founder of synchronized technologies which provides cyber risk and compliance management solutions as chief information security officer he is responsible for overall it security and the compliance at uh, synchronized he holds a btech in computer science and engineering ms by research in cryptography cloud security and privacy PhD in computer science with research area privacy preserving intrusion detection he has uh, 17 years of industry experience with uh, organizations like Cisco Lucent and Cdot prior to building synchronize in 2017 a non speaker he also has multiple publications to his credit we are very happy to have you today over to you mr thank you so much manju uh, a very good evening to everyone um thank you for joining for uh, this call uh, or this session rather being so much in calls got used it to say in call but yeah so uh thank you for such a good introduction as well in fact i had a full slide for that about introducing myself but then you made it easy by you know um uh, introducing me thank you for that much okay so let's dive in um what to expect in the next 40 to 45 minutes or so that we have i leave plenty of room for q and a as well uh i'm going to cover in this talk uh what is risk based vulnerability management at all right i mean we'll of course come to basics of what is vulnerability management and then what are the different nuances so we'll start with definitions and few examples because there are a lot of myths around uh, the fundamental definitions itself okay so things like what is a vulnerability what is a threat how is it different from a control or what is a risk right so there are simply so many terms floating around but we as engineers i'm assuming most of you in this call are engineers we prefer to have crystal clear uh, definitions before even we solve any problem okay so we'll also see what are the goals or what should be the goal of a vulnerability management solution right what are different myths on it what are current problems on it and what are the solution directions and how we at seconize are pioneering the space using risk principles okay so this is a brief agenda for my talk uh so let's let's get in uh to the talk itself okay so let's start with a very uh, uh high level overview of what the current challenges are in security assessment right i'm sure i mean in this particular audience at least you would have heard of Uh, security assessments in some uh, shape or form or you have done it in the past yourself or at least you are part of organizations that have conducted or i'm sure at least you would have heard about <clears throat> vulnerability analysis penetration testing and things like that right so the need for a security assessment of course it's quite very clear uh, because overall there is 600 billion loss to companies due to a cyber attack and the security assessments are in a way to identify the loopholes in the infrastructure much much before and on an average 4 million average cost of a data breach right if, if data gets leaked uh, or if systems are down there are huge losses uh, that you know companies uh, incur okay and what what can companies do what can organizations do to prevent this of course it all starts with the security assessment but since there is a global skill shortage uh, of uh, expert uh experts who can do these assessments uh it's still you know done in a very very traditional uh, sense okay uh, what is a traditional risk assessment or how is it done traditionally right it's a point in time assessment uh, people have this annual uh vapt cycles or you know six months once kind of a thing which are predominantly technical in nature right most of the, often they're not once the vapt assessments are done um then the reports are quite technical in nature and the executives have very hard time uh, understanding or interpreting what it is i i once spoke to a cio of a big hospital uh, imagine cio the chief information officer and uh, since there was a threat for that hospital they got a technical assessment done 
and uh, they got this bunch of spreadsheets from uh, the researchers or, or the company that they have engaged with. And simply they had no clue what to do with that, right? So is that manual in nature and you know, uh, the IT environment itself is uh, diverse in the sense that they have few assets on cloud, if you are on-prem, uh, few, few uh, employees are working from home. So the complexity increases, right? So what happens to, to all these challenges? They are blind to ongoing risks, okay? 91% of the board members cannot interpret what risk, cyber risk means, okay? And 40% of the time spent on compliances, which becomes pure ritual. Because of compliance, they may be doing it, but really can't make sense out of it or get value from it. Right. So these are the current challenges of uh, security assessment. Okay. Now, why do we need to take a security assessment? Again, the big bold term or the elephant in the room is cyber risk. But what is cyber risk at all? Right. Everyone, it's it's again like uh, the six uh, men and the blind and six blind men and the elephant kind of right. I mean, um, so there's already an elephant uh, uh, in the room which nobody uh, um, wants to openly talk about. At the same time, there are you know six people, the blind people, the story which are, they're trying to uh, interpret what this elephant is uh, 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 looks like as well, right? So that is exactly the reason why we need to understand what is not a cyber risk. Yes, right. So let's try to demystify risk itself. What is it? What it is not? Unless we demystify what it is not and clearly define what it is, we cannot tame this elephant. Okay. So what is what is not what is not a, a risk, right? So some of these can be controversial, and people may push me back, saying that hey, how can you say uh, things like this, which is not a cyber risk? But towards the end of the talk, I'm sure they'll be convinced of why certain is not a risk. Okay. So the very first thing, existence of a vulnerability. Okay. So by very reason that uh, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, can uh, anyone suggest a way to turn off my notifications? It's a little bit distracting. Anyone knows how to turn uh, off? Okay, uh, so I've made you a co-host so that you can share your presentation. That is why, let me just try. I'll just... Uh... Okay, yeah, if there is a way to uh, you know, turn off that, but even other ways, that's fine, right? So what is not a risk? Existence of a vulnerability, right? Somebody found a vulnerability, okay? And uh, it's not yet a risk. Okay, why? We don't know uh, uh, what exactly is the risk emanating from that vulnerability. Probably there is a read-only blog and there is a SQL injection vulnerability on it and there is no real uh, impact of that vulnerability yet, right? Now, in this one sentence, I've used so many things like we have vulnerability, you have uh, SQL injection, you have an impact and things like that, right? Absence of control. Somebody may say, hey, uh, you don't even have an advanced malware uh, analysis or you're not participating in or your uh, uh, threat intelligence exercises or fire drills, uh, you are at risk. Maybe, maybe not, right? Absence of a control or you can say that, hey, your data center, you're entering your data center and there's no logbook there, it's a risk. Maybe, maybe not, right? So I'm trying to clear the air around the fear, uncertainty, doubt around what exactly cyber risk is not, right? Presence of an indicator of compromise. Somebody did their threat, threat hunting exercise and found a file hash, which is part of some ransomware attack. Or somebody uh, in, in your organization has a past criminal background. Are they, uh, is it a cyber risk yet? Maybe, maybe not. Broken processes, right? Absence of a formal policy. Right? Maybe you don't have a social media policy, but is it a risk? Maybe, maybe not. Right, so it's very, very important for us to understand. There are a lot of words that I've put here. You know, something like a vulnerability, a control, a threat actor, uh, a risk. Right. So in the next five to ten minutes, let's quickly see the definitions of what these are. Right. Unless we understand, appreciate, and digest these definitions, we'll not be able to define what cyber risk itself means. Okay, so let's quickly see a few definitions. I, I, I don't intend to make it a, a boring academic lecture, but it's very important for us to understand these definitions before we proceed with the talk itself, right? So what is a vulnerability, right? People talk about vulnerability management and you know finding out vulnerabilities in the systems and things like that, but what, what exactly is that, right? 
it could be, it is a weakness of course the academic definition is here on your screen you i mean we can make uh, we can we can circulate this slide deck as well for your offline consumption but uh, vulnerability is a weakness in the information system it could be a weakness that could be exploited and it might have an adverse impact right it might have that's key right the weakness could be your systems are not configured properly your there is a there is a there, there is a certain way the code is written it can be exploited for example there is a sql injection possible uh, encryption is not done probably somebody is given excessive privileges probably multi factor authentication is not enabled probably there is a cve uh, that is doing rounds on the internet is there on one of your systems right so that is a vulnerability okay but what is a threat people sometimes interchangeably use vulnerability and threat but we need to be very very clear on what is a vulnerability and what is a threat right now threat is a given circumstance or a likely event if that happens then there is an adverse impact it could be on an organization operations or a particular asset or individuals right only if that circumstance or an event happens there is an impact denial of service is a threat ransomware is a threat phishing is a threat data breach is a threat espionage is a threat right so we need to be very clear on what is a vulnerability and what is a threat okay now data breach can happen via a sql injection data breach or a data leakage can happen if there is lack of encryption you see the difference now the threat is about what is likely to happen that might have an adverse impact vulnerability is about the cause way to the source of that particular threat okay so moving on who is a threat actor now uh, uh, remember folks threat don't uh, exist in isolation there is a threat agent or a threat actor depending upon uh, the the jargon that's used of course threat actor is the most commonly used term for that but you can also call it threat agent threat actor is an individual or a group of individuals who can manifest a threat to the organization it could be disgruntled employees it could be professional cyber criminals whom you can hire uh, if if you want to launch a ddos attack on a particular uh, organization it's not that you necessarily do it but you can hire someone right to do it sometimes competitors also threat actors probably they're snooping around your ip nation state actors people uh, you know uh, it, it's like north korea uh, attacking us or china hacking us or russia hacking you uh, whatever right these are these are very very powerful nation state actors and vendors sometimes the vendors can be threat actors as well and that's the reason why uh, uh, the best practice is emphasized doing vendor security assessments and things like that right so without a threat actor there is no threat okay and without a vulnerability there is no threat so we need to understand all this terminology very very clear okay and what is a big deal i mean we are talking about vulnerabilities we are talking about threats we are talking about threat actors what is a big deal if there is a vulnerability what is the big deal if threat actor impact is the big deal what is a big deal in the sense that what what is likely to happen to an organization right it could be financial losses impact means tangible something tangible and sometimes intangible as well reputational loss is sometimes intangible you, you you may not be able to quantify it right i mean right so things like loss of productivity revenue losses cost of investigations cost of pr right for example there is a a, a bank uh, probably credit cards information is leaked then there is cost of investigation there is cost of reissuing their credit cards right and cost of pr they may have to put a Uh, uh, help us where you know they have to answer questions from their uh, angry customers maybe there are some fraudulent uh, charges on their credit cards because of this data breach loss of brand reputation right so the entire goal of whatever we are talking about cyber risk is about reducing this impact that's all there is nothing much the whole goal of whatever we do inside cyber security whether it's offensive defensive protective detective whatever is to reduce the impact on an organization so that's the key okay so the last slide on definitions i promise okay what is a control 
Now, a control is something like a technical or a non-technical information uh, that exists to uh, information system rather. I mean, I'll admit, uh, edit that that exists to remediate or mitigate any potential impact. Now, people may say, uh, please install antivirus. Right? Antivirus is a control. Now, what what will what is the benefit you get? Probably it will prevent uh, viruses spreading in your organization. Firewall as a sim. Security policies are kind of control, right? It's the, it, the information security policies your organization uh, has written and, and, and enforced is a kind of control, okay? Security awareness trainings, the phishing simulations, the trainings that you go through, these are all preparing yourself to reduce the impact. So those are all controls, right? So we, we saw what is a vulnerability, we saw what is a threat, we saw what is a threat actor, uh, we saw what is impact, uh, we saw what is control. Now, with this background, let us try to define the elephant, which is risk, right? So what is risk now? The cyber risk is the likelihood of a threat's occurrence. Now, threat may occur, may not occur. That's exactly the reason why I said mere existence of vulnerabilities is not a threat yet, right? So there should be a threat and there should be a likelihood of threat happening, right? By a threat actor resulting in adverse impact, it's, it's as simple as that, right? So if you're not uh, living on a seashore, you are less likely uh, to be hit by tsunami. If you're not, um, you know, uh, you're not in an earthquake zone, um, then, I mean, geographically, you're not, you're not uh, in the earthquake zone, then you're less likely to get a, uh, impacted by an earthquake, right? So the risk is the contextual information, right? It's likelihood of a threat's occurrence, by a threat actor resulting in an adverse impact after exploiting a vulnerability. Okay, so example could be there's a 90% likelihood of a cyber criminal, see the actor is cyber criminal, exploiting a SQL injection on a website resulting in loss of data. Unless we put this context around it, it's all about, uh, you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt. Each time there's a vulnerability, or a ransomware attack in the news, uh, 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 what clouds are thinking is this exact fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If you have to remove that and probably deal with the problem more objectively, we need to think about risk in a particular context, right? What if the SQL injection is there on a, a read-only blog where there is no customer information? Probably there is no loss of data, right? Or loss of data might be there, but it's just public information. It's there anyway. Right? What if there is a SQL injection on a website, but probably it is an internal and there is no professional cyber criminal inside? We don't know. Right? So that's the kind of context we need to bring in when we're talking about risk. Okay. So feel free to stop me, folks. I mean, anytime I wanted to make it more uh, interactive and things like that, so that you know you better uh, uh, appreciate and understand what I'm talking rather than a monologue uh, kind of thing. Right? So. With this context, we can define cyber risk now and what it is, right? You can say 90% likelihood example I've taken or estimated 10 million likely loss of revenue. You are being a little bit more precise than saying that, hey, there could be a, lo a loss of revenue uh, if this is stolen, right? But from whom, by whom? Uh, it could be due to a disgruntled employee stealing your intellectual property from a file server over the next one year. So that's kind of a contextual information that defines risk. There is an estimated 12 hours of downtime due to an untrained employee clicking on a phishing email resulting in disruption of operations. That is risk. Untrained employee by own is not a risk because if he doesn't have anything to do with the email, uh, then there's no impact of disrupting on operations, right? So that's the contextual information, okay? I hope the first 10 minutes, uh, you have clear definitions of what this terminology is about, which I'm going to use in the next 20 to 25 minutes or so, okay? So moving on, what is the goal of vulnerability management, right? We talk about vulnerabilities, you would have heard of vulnerability management, uh, but don't worry if you have not heard of it as well, because that's what I'm going to cover in, in how do you tame this complexity. But the goal of vulnerability management is to de-risk your organization from cyber threats. That's it. There is no other goal at all. The whole goal of 
uh, doing managing vulnerabilities is to de-risk your organization. Now, what exactly is de-risk? Now, de-risk is a simple term, uh, uh, like taking steps to less, uh, to, to make something less risky. It's like uh, probably you, 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 you wear a helmet while driving that you want to be less risky to uh, any accident, right? Or probably you will invest your money in something less riskier so that you don't want to do any uh, get involved into any financial losses so in similar way you want to take some measures managing these vulnerabilities so that your organization is less likely to involve in a financial loss okay so uh, i i i mean just you know get this statement into uh, uh, into uh, your mind if you're doing vulnerability management or if you're aspiring to become a vulnerability uh, analyst for your organization, or if, for that matter, if you're doing a security assessment as well. The so whole goal is to de-risk your organization. That's it. Okay. So now, what are the myths in current vulnerability management? You would have heard, as I said, some shape or form what vulnerability management is all about. But there are numerous myths in that. Okay. Let us try to spend like five to ten minutes understanding what are the different myths of vulnerability management itself. Okay, the first myth, all vulnerabilities are knowable, right? It's a total myth that you can know all these vulnerabilities. There is exceedingly, in, uh, what to say, high expectation or high emphasis on uh, only two or three types of vulnerabilities. Uh, if, you, if you're reading any blogs or following any uh, uh, research papers and things like that, so much over emphasis on probably CVEs, probably application vulnerabilities, the OWASP prop 10, probably the cloud misconfigurations, the CIS benchmarks for cloud, probably you know, some S3 bucket is leaking and things like that. I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're wrong, right? I'm saying that those are only one small tip of the iceberg. There are many, many, many more things that we need to do, okay? So other things that as network misconfigurations. What about SaaS misconfigurations? Probably you are scanning all your cloud misconfigurations and application vulnerabilities. What about your SaaS? Uh, did you scan your GitHub? Did you scan uh, a scan? I'm in the sense that scan to identify if the GitHub is configured properly. Is your Office 365 configured properly? Are your operating systems configured properly? Are your content containers properly? Or you have people awareness issue. Probably people are never trained at all on the security and related things. Probably there is Active Directory that is never ever uh, uh, tested at all, right? And all these assuming that um, every vulnerability is known, but what about zero days? What about unreported vulnerabilities? There are so many more vulnerabilities that are traded on the dark web or in closed circles, which never come out at all, right? So it's always, uh, we should be very, very clear and more realistic uh, in, in assuming that all vulnerabilities are known. No. At no point in time, you'll be able to know all kind of vulnerabilities. Now, how will this help? You will proactively plan your measures accordingly, only if you know that there are certain type of vulnerabilities that are not always knowable, okay? Probably proactively, you may put certain defenses or probably you may want to uh, fix your process gaps, right, by knowing this uh, myth, okay? Now, what are other myths? The first one we have covered, uh, all vulnerabilities are knowable, uh, can be identified. Uh, all identified vulnerabilities with known exploits are exploitable. This is very, very important myth. That's the reason why in the very first slide I said mere existence of a vulnerability, okay, doesn't pose a risk because is there an exploit at all? Is there somebody written an exploit for that? What is an exploit? Exploit is a small program that takes advantage of existence of this vulnerability in order to penetrate into a system. That's the reason why uh, researchers do penetration testing as well, right? That's the reason why I have mentioned that a mere existence of SQL injection may not necessarily be uh, a, a risk yet. Maybe, maybe it is uh, you know, hosted behind a VAF. Maybe it's not exploitable at all, right? And maybe it is exploitable, but will they be exploited at all? The third one, there's a subtle difference there. The third one means that it is exploitable, but there are no threat actors in that environment who can exploit them. Okay? 
The fourth one is, are these vulnerabilities applicable to me or my org? Uh, let's say for as an example, you have read about uh, Swift malware, right? I mean, a, a malware that is impacting a particular type of vulnerability on a particular type of, of um, a network device uh, in a particular vertical, right? Like a banking vertical. Now, the moment you read that, hey, there's a malware prevailing on the internet, uh, but you are not really inside a banking uh, environment, but maybe you are into a critical infrastructure, maybe you are into oil and gas, maybe you are into uh, some other vertical. It may be or may not be applicable to you at all because the streams of malware have a particular purpose where the threat actors are targeting a certain type of vertical. Okay. Right. So, and all the identified vulnerabilities of same type should be treated in same way. This is another big myth. Classic example, last December, not last December, the previous December uh, 2021, Log4j happened, right? I mean, uh, of course, many, many more such things have happened. The moment, I mean, we started getting calls from our customers and, you know, uh, you know panic messages saying that, hey, are we impacted or is there any impact and things like that. Uh, we did some, you know, as 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 the vulnerabilities and exploits are being made available, we are trying to do proactive tests to our uh, to our customers, and then trying to find out. Uh, in one instance, we found out like Log4j is, is applicable to some twenty odd servers, okay, and they have just like one IT guy. Now, should we treat all these twenty odd servers in the same way? Is it very realistic to to go and patch all these twenty servers at the same time? No. But all these 20 servers are of no, not of same importance for them. Some are having customer data. Some are not being used. Some are being used in the proof, proof of concepts, which doesn't have any anything at all. You're, you're getting the point that they need to prioritize based on the context of the asset. And all identified vulnerabilities above, let's say, CVSs greater than eight are risky. Now, the moment there is a CVE on the internet, you know, somebody publishes there's a new CVE in. Uh, Fortinet firewall, there is a VPN has a, a vulnerability or Cisco has a vulnerability or Microsoft has a vulnerability, right? And they publish the score, common vulnerability scoring system rather than eight. I know of organizations who have uh, drafted policies around saying that each time you have a CVS is greater than eight, just fix it, which is absolutely not feasible and it's not needed as well because CVS score by very definition is not a risk score. It is just vulnerability severity. You need to do a lot more thing. We'll cover in the next few minutes on what is that lot more thing, right? To nail it in one sentence, do not panic if there's a CVS score greater than eight, uh, that it is risky. It may be, may not be wrong, may, may, maybe not, right? And all identified vulnerabilities can be or should be mitigated. Absolutely no way. It is unrealistic goal it is unrealistic goal to assume that everything should be mitigated. You are uh, setting up for failure if you have such a policy saying that all identified vulnerabilities should be mitigated. No amount of resources, you'll be able to do it, right? So these are the, some of the prevalent myths in vulnerability management uh, I want you to be aware of, right? So that's the reason why we need to adopt risk-based vulnerability management, okay? So we'll get there. Okay, so these are some of the myths. Now, what is the challenge? What are the different challenges in the current vulnerability management that we need something better, that you know, something like a risk-based uh, vulnerability management, which we are pioneering at Second Eyes, right? So let's understand what are the different challenges first. The first one is products or services fitting. We'll cover this in detail, no worries, right? There is tools fitting, alerts fitting, process fitting, but I'm very, very carefully using the term fatigue, right? Fatigue is like, you know, you're stressed out of the IT teams and the security teams are so sandwiched and stressed out of uh, the complexity that is growing. Okay, so what are these four things? Let's quickly check that out. The first one, products and services fatigue. The sheer number of IT products and services being used to conduct business is staggeringly high. Just check in your own organizations. How many number of SaaS applications you are using? How many different types of operating systems you are using? How many internal applications are there? How many network devices are there? How many cloud services are there? 
how many types of databases or instances of databases are there? Now, how do you track uh, uh, the, the, the security advisories and the vulnerabilities and things like that that are that are there for these different things? Right? So the complexity is so high. On an average, I think there are uh, a medium, mid to large organization uses 40 to 50 IT products or so. And uh, uh, the, the mid or mid kind of an organization and the large organizations, I think there is a, some study which says that security products alone are some 30 to 40 ish in larger organizations. Imagine there are 30 security products alone into easily three or four times uh, the number of IT products and services being used to conduct the business. Right? This is one of the primary reasons that is causing fatigue. Talk to any of your IT administrators. In case if you are, probably you can identify that with yourself as well. Right? You would have uh, you know, uh, evaluating um, antivirus solution, just for example. Right? Uh, something works for uh, Windows, doesn't work for Mac, something doesn't work for Linux, something is not there. So that's just for one control that we're talking about. Right? So the complexity is so high, which is causing fatigue. Now, second challenge, tools fatigue. The number of scanning tools needed to identify vulnerabilities are again staggeringly high. Okay, so why is that so? Because each scanner that is used to identify vulnerability is so niche that it can do one job really, really well, right? Application security scanners, you have burp suits, zaps, commercial ones, Cloud CSPM, cloud security posture scanners, there are half a dozen of them. Container specific, there are dozens of them. CV scanners, attack surface identification, OS scanners, network, database, SAS. And on top of this, what about the people process vulnerabilities? Well, not really a scanner, but you need to track them, right? Right? Now, how do you track these respect to scanner results? Even if you have bought them, deployed them, imagine how what kind of a team you need to deploy in order to go and uh, first understand, learn those tools, deploy them, get those raw outputs, and then make some sense of it, then go and uh, fix them. It's a nightmare, nightmare. Okay. Next. Uh, so, of course, how do you address these tools fatigue? Then uh, you need to adopt something like a platform that aggregates and consolidates all these scanner results. Uh, if you want to adopt, you know, probably you can look around some open source stuff like Defectojo, which are preliminary ones. Or I've seen even people uh, building using Jira, where you dump all these scanner results. Or you can buy some commercial products that unify all these scanner results, something like what we are building at Secnice. Right? So that's one way of addressing the tools fatigue. You need to take a platform approach. You can't buy uh, the point products and then start stitching them together because that's a nightmare. You need uh, expert uh, expertise of stitching them together as well. Okay. Now there is an, another challenge. Alerts fitting. Your tools have increased. First, your products have increased. For each product type, your tools, the scanning tools have increased. Now the third one, each of the tool is producing again uh, hundreds of alerts saying that, hey, uh, these many vulnerabilities I found and you know things like that. Insane number of low fidelity alerts, insane number. What is the problem here? You end up with 10,000 vulnerabilities that you don't know uh, have head or tail off. Uh, none of these tools have a common uh, jargon or common prioritization schemes and things like that. It's all like chaos. Because they don't have context, they don't have correlation. You don't even know whether those are exploitable at all. And there are no scientific ways of prioritization. Vanilla methods, right? How do I identify risk? That's exactly the point I've started this conversation with saying that mere presence of a vulnerability is not a risk. Now, how do I, how do I identify the risk in this? It's total chaotic. Okay. So I, my intention was not to, uh, you know, paint an ugly or a sorrow picture here. My intention is to bring up the challenges so that we can address them in a better way, right? Now, how do we address these alerts fatigue? Now, we need contextualization. Now, what does this mean by contextualization, right? Each time an advisory comes, is it relevant to your organization at all? 
Are you using that product at all in your organization, right? Each time there's a malware or an attack you have read in the news, right? Does that impact? For example, that is a banking malware. Maybe it may not be um, uh, addressing your healthcare uh, organization. Just take an example. And how do you correlate it all, right? So you have identified vulnerabilities, but what threat do they pose? You, you've, you've said something like a buffer overflow, but what does that mean? Does that buffer overflow uh, disrupt my operations or does that buffer overflow leak the data? What is the threat? What type of TDPs exist? What type of mitigations are there against this threat? Right? So the kind of a correlation is very, very important. Now, prediction is another problem, right? You found a vulnerability, but what is it that uh, can somebody build an exploit? So there are, of course, standards emerging called as EPSs, Exploit Prediction Scoring System. That's, that's what we're seeing on the slide as well. Can we forecast whether a threat emerges, right? It just took probably 18 to 24 hours the moment Log4j was announced that exploit started coming. There are vulnerabilities identified as back as 2004 or five. There are no exploits at all, even today, but the CVSO score could be nine or so, right? So that's the reason we should not be using CVSs greater than it could be eight or nine or seven or whatever. It is not prioritization. EPSs, the exploit prediction scoring greater than X, it could be eight or nine or whatever. And I think EPSs is between zero to one, uh, because it's a probability uh, beyond certain thing. It's again, not a prioritization at all. You can't prioritize based on somebody building uh, an exploit or not, right? So how you need to prioritize? Uh, again, based on the foundational principles, the likelihood of a threat occurrence into impact, right? So we have uh, a free uh, app, uh, riskscore.info. You can go around, play around uh, to get calculate the risk scores for different vulnerabilities. It's super fun, it's free. Okay, it's riskscore.info. Probably at the end of this, I can type it in the chat or something, right? So there is another major fatigue, which not many people are talking about, but they understand this fatigue is process fatigue. After all this hard work, you have identified the vulnerabilities, you have contextualized them, correlated them, prioritized them, found out the top, top, top risky ones. But what next? Who is accountable for that in your organization? Do you have somebody who can own it up? Somebody who can analyze them? Of course, you can say you just go and dump it in Jira, but remember all your prior fatigues, right? It's not just dumping in Jira. Sometimes you may have to live with these vulnerabilities as well, called as exceptions. And maybe the OEM vendor is not giving any patches. Maybe you don't have a budget to upgrade them. Maybe you have to live with these vulnerabilities and mark them as exceptions and live with the risk. Where are we tracking that? How to fix them? How to verify these fixes? Right? So all these are important challenges. Almost day in and day out, you ask any of the IT, IT administrators or the security administrators, or if you, some of you, I'm sure you'd be able to identify some of this, right? Now with this challenge, how do, how do you de-risk? How do you de-risk again? Uh, going back, de-risk is like reducing the impact, right? Now, I'm sure some of you in the in the in the security circles would have heard of this concept called as OODA loop, the observe, orient, uh, decide, act uh, principle, uh, which is uh, uh, to to which is I mean predominantly used in threat hunting stages. Uh, if you see the cycle, the cybersecurity cycle of identify, protect, detect, remediate, respond. Traditionally, the threat hunting, uh, detect and remediate is where you use OOD loops, right? But we need to shift left that whole, uh, you know, OOD loop concept, wherein you identify. So the vulnerability management comes uh, at the very beginning of the cycle that is identify cycle. If you identify that and then remediate them in a faster loop, then likely that, yeah, this, this is what I meant. You have to shift left the OOD loops from detect remediate to identify protect so that you are reducing the likelihood of the impact, right? The faster you are identifying the vulnerabilities or the earlier in the cycle you identify the risk, the more likely that, uh, you know, your impact on the organization is less, okay? So it's about 
patching the CVE that causes uh, PTR ransomware uh, is, is cheaper than working on a backup solution to respond in case of uh, ransomware happens. It's, it's that simple, right? So shifting left uh, and then, you know, having processes in place, uh, bringing in automation for remediation as well, these kind of measures will help you reduce some of the process fatigue. Okay. So uh, I'm not sure how much time we have, like we are almost there. Uh, so de-risking the cyberspace. Um, how do you de-risk your cyberspace? Well, one is of course, uh, you know, the CISO should know, move away from uh, the traditional checkbox driven point in time, technical, arcane assessments to something that's more continuous, more impact-based, more near real time and unified, right? That's what uh, gives you uh, better results uh, for, for the efforts that are being done, uh, right? So uh, this is our product, uh, Seconized Data Center. Um, at a high level, the architecture is on your right side on how we are trying to solve this problem in the sense that, we, uh, it's a cloud SaaS product, uh, wherein uh, the raw data, the scanners output, it could be, uh, of course, the flow something like is like this. You have to discover onboard all your IT assets. Um, the IT assets could be anything, servers, applications, cloud, network devices, uh, onboard them, contextualize or profile these assets, um, and then we scan them. The product comes with the scanners inbuilt, or if you have some scanners already bought and you can ingest the data as well. The core USB is the risk modeling of it. How do you contextualize it? The, the problems that I've mentioned, how do you, uh, you know, bring in your asset context and calculate the risk score rather than relying on CVSS kind of score and then auto remediate. Of course, all this in order to ensure your compliance uh, requirements as well. Right, so that's in a nutshell how the data center hack works, and of course there are a few uh, real product screenshots um, uh, in the sense that how do we show risk, not just the CVS score, uh, what are the details, how do we contextualize them, how do we prioritize them? It's all super simplified. Uh, it's a SaaS delivered, so there's nothing that um, our customers need to install as such uh, to to deploy this. Um, and, and yeah, we have different offerings as well in the sense that we do something called a security posture improvement. It's a one-time assessment. We can completely build a risk profile of your organization and uh, you can go after mitigating them and then we do a validation assessment or you can completely come to our SaaS subscription wherein this happens on a continuous basis because threat landscape is ever changing. Your IT landscape is ever changing that X surface is ever changing. So that's the reason why you need to do it on a basis as well. Okay. So numerous uh, awards and recognition as well over the years. Uh, to name a few, we are the most innovative product of the year uh, 2021 from DSEI. Uh, and then we were uh, cybersecurity grand challenge finalists, which is conducted by Ministry of IT. Um, and a numerous recognition globally as well. And some of our select few customers uh, in different verticals because security is of course everybody's problem. Uh, we have financial services, education, healthcare, logistics, IT, IT enabled services, data centers. I think I'm sure, you know, many of these brands you can uh, recognize as well, right? So I think that's it for my uh, talk. We have like 10 minutes. We'll be super glad to take any questions uh happy to answer um you know uh, any, any question starts that you have thank you very much uh, shashank uh, for our video and uh, for peeling the layers of this one by one and you know, talking about this vulnerability management yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's have the discussion any questions anyone There was some chat message. Okay, I think somebody had to leave. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, Sasan Krishna Kumar here. I just want to know uh, this is is it supporting as a sim tool or it's only a risk management tool? Okay, so we augment the sim capabilities in the sense that, as I said, in the IPDRR cycle, we come at the early phases of risk identification, uh, and the platform is completely API driven. So if you have to extract the vulnerabilities and dump it into um, sim more than welcome to do it. You can enrich your SIM findings as well. Or if you have uh, any threat intel API integrations into your SIM that you would like to consume in the risk management and enrich your vulnerabilities, you're free to do so as well. That means this tool, this tool will take the input from SIM yeah. and assess it and you will, Quite validate, so. yeah, you will validate the risk and you can yes. generate the report. Also. Yes. So it's more likely or more valuable if you use these results in your SIM. Sometimes what happens is you have vulnerabilities exploit and threat intel contextualized here on your critical assets. You may want to cross correlate whether there are any attacks happening from the logs that are identified your, in your SIM. So, uh, other than the SIM, uh, can this be deployed in some firewalls or some other reports or generating reports? So it's a SaaS product. What we can do is assess your firewall as well. Uh, we have auto remediation uh, for which we were the part of uh, the, the grand challenge where we demonstrated that the vulnerabilities identified can be mitigated by pushing policies into your web application firewalls, if that's what you meant. We can- we have web application firewalls. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we demonstrated it for an open source WAF, but the architecture is flexible that if you want to push a rule to your, uh, proprietary firewall via API and block certain CV, then why not? Okay. Super. Any any other questions, thoughts? Uh, one more question. Consider that nowadays many companies are going through layer three features. I, I'm sorry. Layer I three features. Is it audible? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are in many companies nowadays. They are going to layer switch switches, layer three switches. Now, how can you because uh, they are trying to see that replace the router factor and try to integrate? Not, sorry, Mr. Krishna, I, it's hardly. I don't know. Is it for everyone or is it for me? Uh, uh, is it your not voice, is, your voice is very feeble, uh, Krishna. Okay, okay. So, uh, am I loud now? Yeah. Yeah, it's a little better now. Yeah. Uh Shisham, this is about easy nowadays in the last few years there is a trend which is going that replace the router levels activity and bring in uh, layer three switches. And uh, some of the parts it will be integrated through firewall through layer three switches. So this tool which you are trying to uh, use in SAS, can this integrate together and analyze and give an information? Yes, yes, definitely. One thing is a router or a layer three switch can be automatically assessed using our I mean, depends upon the make of the tool, of course, that we can uh, check the configuration checks of the tool. Alternatively, if there are configuration checks, we can also push uh, policies onto the device, uh, assuming it supports APIs and things like that. That can be done as well. So uh, can I ask one more technical question? What sure. is the default port you are asking, you are trying to open, ask to open? What will be the default ports which will be opened for your application? It's a SaaS uh, application uh, as such, right? I mean, uh, if you're using purely from a cloud assessment, uh, like a cloud security portion management, you don't need to open any ports. It's just a read-only account that you need to create in your AWS uh, account. But if it is any operating system level assessments, then we use the traditional SSH port uh, to do the configuration checks of OS. Yeah. I uh, just a question like how if I'm using a uh, cloud based uh, uh, vulnerability assessment tool, something like call is VMDR, then how I can integrate this? Like, uh, uh, can I get the uh, vulnerability status for uh, this tool also? Like, uh, how it is? I'm sorry, Santosh, I can't hear you said something cloud, but no, no, it's something like uh, if I'm using a VMDR, like call is VMDR, uh, huh? the vulnerability assessment tool, uh -huh. uh, then how uh, the uh, like if I get a proper report uh, to be taken, like uh, uh -huh. remediation and all. 
Uh huh. Yeah. So quiet VMBR is something that comes closer to our offering, but okay. the risk, the true risk feature, they have recently introduced uh, only. But we have been pioneering this for almost 2017 ish, right? Uh, even Qualys, I think uh, it's predominantly the endpoint uh, focused and uh, it has certain gaps that we address, especially in the application vulnerabilities and things like that. Network assessments and all uh, Qualys VMDR doesn't do. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Any, any Anything else uh, that uh, you would like to ask? Or would anyone uh, like to add something to what he has already uh, discussed, yeah. Dr. Penetban or uh, Subrahu, sir? Any points to add? No, Manju. Okay. Enjoy the session. Maybe just one question coming from the other side. Sure. Because uh, with all your expertise in uh, risk-based vulnerability and all, uh, if you were to be an auditor today, right? How would you go about auditing a vulnerability management program of a company? Generally, yeah. you would say, see the, the standard approach is, you know, okay, look at your policy, you do quarterly, you do half LA. As you said, CVS is more than when we fix all high, we let all medium and, you know, look at the reports and see whether the... Uh, identified when I address and all that's a standard approach, right? Yeah, yeah. With your experience, uh, how would you go about auditing a vulnerability management program of a company? Yeah, so that's a very good question, uh, there, right? I mean, even like yesterday or so, uh, someone was struggling with similar saying that the current policies, the traditional vulnerability management policy, which says CVS is greater than eight, it's not helping them because they'll always not be able to comply with it, hmm. right? They can never because, and even that's not a right metric for them to adhere to because as I said, like CVS score is only a severity score, but not really a risk score, right? So the first thing when we do audit, first we understand whether the policy has any risk elements in it or is it vanilla vulnerability management policy that is like brought in here and there, hmm. right? And another important aspect that we do is that what about the closures? So identification is one, uh, whether the policy covers coverage, whether the policy intentions SLEs in closing that and validating it, how often that is being done, right? What is the mean time to remediate? These are the variety of uh, things that we would look into when we are auditing purely their vulnerability management program alone. Okay. And the question more about uh... Do you also look at what happens before the vulnerability scan itself runs? Uh, how does the company identify, uh, you know, uh, uh, the risks, uh, kind of a thing? I, I think, I mean, so vulnerability scanning is the first step in terms of identifying the risks itself, especially the technology risks that can be scanned using tools. But more often than not, what happens is that the people and process risks Either there are a handful of them that goes into the risk registry or they're completely dropped out as well. These things happen. Or sometimes they may miss complete uh, you know, uh, attack vector itself. So uh, we have seen in, in the past where companies have done their application security assessment, the cloud assessment is completely missed out or the servers were never checked for their baselines. So these okay. things also happen. So that's the reason why the coverage is important. Um, the second one is uh, the people in process risks, along with the technology risks that are scannable, the SLEs, the closures, these are all the aspects. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That, that, was, that was a good question. It's just super right. Any, any further questions, thoughts anyone would like to share or? Okay. Uh, Dr. Anirban, would you like to add something? Yeah. 
Thank you, Shishank. I think the uh, session went off very well. I was uh, not able to fully participate because I was doubling up in another session also. But uh, anyway, I was uh, listening to you uh, through most of the uh, sessions. Uh, I think it was quite a useful uh, session for all our uh, people. Yeah. Uh, we missed you last week. I think it was fine. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. You were able to make it this time. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll uh, try to be in touch and. Uh, sure. Um, Feel free to reach out. As, uh, I think Manju was uh, telling in the beginning that um, we need to identify the tools which actually help uh, our data protection officers for the purpose of privacy management. Yes. So that is our objective, and we would uh, like to have more inputs from you on that uh, regard. Yeah, Manju, please take over. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shashan. And it was a very informative session, at the, and uh, the way you explained it uh, you know, took us right from the beginning, explaining the concepts. And it was, uh, you would have uh, made a good teacher also. And uh, it's a very interesting topic. And uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, finding time to give this session. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And as Navisar said, Mr. Shashang will keep in touch because we would uh, need more inputs uh, from you uh, for uh, our you know, FDPPI's activities in the way forward. Absolutely. So there is one thing that I did not mention. We also do the uh, compliance assessments and I think the privacy impact assessments we don't do right now, but probably in the future sometime we can touch upon assessments of privacy impact assessments and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.